Today we have Ashutosh with us. Uh, we have Peter and Ashutosh who is going to talk about the Coda accounts and tokens. Uh, hi, Peter. Morning, Navin. Hi. Morning. Okay, great. So I hope you're all set for the accounts and tokens. Yes, I am. In fact, this is the one topic which I've never read about. So it will be exciting. Sure. All yours, uh, Peter. I, yes, uh, I will take it from here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, sessions of the day three. Uh, and uh, today with me uh, to my session is uh, Ashash again. So Ashash will be running the chat. And if you guys have any questions, just feel free to drop in the chat and he will actually help you to answer them. Uh, we will have a QA session at the end and we will bring out uh, sort of like the most frequently asked questions uh, to, to that. Uh, so Ashash, how are we running the chat? Like, is there any rules that we need to remind everybody? Yeah, it's going to be the same. Uh, if you have joined any of our previous sessions, um, uh, we do not like promotions in the chat. So that's the only restriction, I guess. Other than that, if you have any questions about the topic, uh, you can just put it out there and I'll be there to help you with the answers. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much about it. No promotions. Um, it might get you banned. So we don't want to ban anyone. So please don't put any promotions. Thank you. Back to you, Peter. Okay, uh, I guess uh, let's get started. So I have prepared a presentation for everybody. So um, let's begin. So with Corda, our uh, platform for blockchain technology, or some, most a lot of people refer to as the, the DLT technology, um, Corda come with a, a series of SDKs, software developer uh, development kit. And today we'll be cover covering two of them, uh, the token and accounts because these two are the most, um, how would I say, most uh, functionality-wise gonna expand your applications. So before we go into that, you know, we said the SDKs are the feature set, then what are we really uh, building on? So let's do a quick recap. So the components of a core app has three primary components. The state is the object that in the core platform, uh, it gets created, uh, updated, stored, or eventually get consumed. The second thing is the contract. It verifies the transactions. Uh, it's the business rules that people have to follow uh, throughout the transactions. And if any of the uh, contract rules is not um, met, then they will, uh, the, the quarter node will reject the transaction. And lastly is the rule, uh, flows. So the flow executes the business logic. Uh, is like the engine that constantly running that will populate uh, the different transaction from one node to another. It will ac actually execute your business logic. So with that three primary components of a core app, you can build an uh, application of any kind. Uh, we have been said uh, in our quarter one, one, also in my day one business use case sessions, uh, Corda is very flexible and it can be uh, the application can develop in basically every industries. So uh, with that said, let's talk about the first topic of my session, which is the tokens. So what is a token? So a token is a representation of an asset. So in the real world, a physical token can be a ticket. You can go to a code check, uh, you hand in your jacket, and then the concierge will give you a token representing your jacket. Um, and you better not lose it because if you do, they are going to ask you, okay, so is that your, is this your jacket? Are you sure? Uh, we got a camera here, you know, so <laughs> those kind of stuff. So that actually shows one of um, the characteristic uh, or benefit uh, of the token. So in the current era, so we now talk, have a, a digital token. So that's like a step up from the physical tokens, because you know what I what I just mentioned. If you lost your physical token, then you are really like you are you are screwed. But now, when we talk about digital tokens, there's a huge benefit behind it. So, what are digital tokens? A fair large amount of people are gonna say, "Oh, cryptocurrency." Uh, they think like uh, they know it. True, cryptocurrency is a subset of digital tokens. Digital tokens are also include many others such as uh, tokenized asset. So that's 
basically has a much wider angle of looking at um, how we can utilize um, the definition of a token in this current digital world. So when you buy a stock, do you always do you always to request a holder certificate from the company? So I, I rarely uh, would think anybody will actually do that, <laughs> right? For example, if you are in the U.S., um, if you buy any stock on Robinhood, you don't necessarily own it. The Robinhood company owns the actual share of the company. You just looks like you own it because you are not having the holder certificate issue directly. For example, let's say Amazon, right? I have a share of Amazon. I can only prove that I own it if I have the holder certificate in hand. Otherwise I have to go through all those like legal process to prove that the stock I have in Robinhood is the, the share that I, I really have. But in right now, the distributed uh, technology world, there's a chance we can change that. We can have, we are looking at a way to basically, everybody can hold a digital token that actually represent um, your physical asset. So after that being said, what are we talking about in the quarter platform? So what will be a token or what is a token on quarter? So first thing first is not a cryptocurrency. The term cryptocurrency has the word currency in it because currency by its definition, it has a much wider angle because it's connected with, um, connected with uh, economy, it connects with sovereignty um, monetization, meaning uh, central banks, right? Central currency, stuff like that. So if you want to build a token on quarter, it will be less likely to become a cryptocurrency because currency by definition need a, 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 a significant liquidity on you know, daily, uh, daily value transfers. So that's why you have the cryptocurrency as its self, uh, as its own category. You know, you have a B, uh, Bitcoin, you have a Ethereum, you have a BTC or like uh, Bitcoin Cash, right? Yeah, uh, something like that. So that's fall into that category. Then what is token on a quarter? So it's a digital representation of asset ownership. So we are more likely to make digital token on the DLT quarter platform to be the representation of a physical asset that you can provide some liquidity on it. Not again, not like a cryptocurrency, but it actually can brings value to your non-liquidable asset. So that's the first thing uh, we would hope that having a token on the quarter platform can achieve. The second thing is a bare instrument represent the liability between issuer and owner. So this one actually has a much wider angle because we talk, talking about liabilities. Liabilities happens almost every second, everywhere, every day, right? So it means Basically, it means the promise between one another, right? It's like, for example, I can have, uh, I can borrow some money or I can borrow, let's say a book. That rep, that's, that's something that's um, fall into a liability. If I borrow a book from, let's say, Oshitosh, he lent me the book. Uh, basically, it's an agreement that he has with me. And that agreement is um, basically, is, um, showcase the liability between me and him. So digital token, we are, we are trying to basically have a situation that you can have it represented on a ledger because again, blockchain is immutable, right? You cannot change it and then it's easily traceable. And if we can have a way to have start representing liabilities on a trust and a stable ledger. So that's going to open up much, much more uh, opportunities uh, in the real life. So that's what we uh, want to achieve in um, basically coming up with these SDKs is we want developers are able to create projects that can represent digital, uh, can represent asset ownership digitally. And second, we want them to represent the liabilities between um, the, the, the participant, either the issuer or the owner. So with that said, you know, 
we, I want to sort of give a, um, a foreseeable or like a forecast of the future that's um, on the Corda network. That will be a tokenized uh, economy on Corda. So first thing first is again, Corda is a block is a private blockchain. Um, all the blockchain characteristic it has it. So that the first thing will bring up the maximum security. So all the transactions will be peer to peer uh, transactions over distributed or decentralized network providing the highest security. So that's the first thing, the first benefit. The second benefit will be simple traceabilities. You know, again, you know, tokens represent asset, represent the liabilities. You, you don't want to um, put yourself in a situation is, yes, you know that it represents asset, it represents liability, but there's no way you can um, basically argue with it. You, there's no one like believing in you. So the DLT characteristic or the blockchain characteristic provides the traceability that you can easily, uh, you can easily uh, done that. So the next one is increased li uh, liquidity and the market assets. So e-liquid asset can now be represented and traded as a whole or fractionally over the market, uh, uh, enabling new sets of owners. So that means there's new opportunity to um, invest in this tokenized economy. So with that said, now let's take a look of how um, token SDK is actually um, developed or how it's designed, architect, right? You know, most of our audience are developers. We want to know how to do it, right? So, yeah. So I will actually put the next 20 minutes into four sections. The first one is token SDK overview. The second uh, section is fixed versus evolvable token type. The third is fungible versus non-fungible tokens. And the last one is token management. Hey, Peter, before you do that, do you want Naveen to come in and do give away some money? Sure, sure. Okay. We can do a quick quiz. Yes. Let's bring up Naveen and uh, I'll bring up Naveen and we'll do our first Slido of the day. All right, Naveen, you're up. Okay, let's just give away. Let's, get, let's start early and everyone who came to the first early one will give away $200 this morning. Oh, two hundred dollars! I thought it would start low. Great, great start. So here we go. We got the first slide of the day. You can use your mobile phone or you can use a browser to go to slide.com. Make sure that you enter that number. And I guess most of you have done this earlier. So let me also track if it is working properly. Great. So this. So let me just repeat the rules. In this quiz, it's not just about giving the right answer, but also. You have to be as fast as possible because that's how you, the, the ranking works. So how many people have already joined? Okay, great. Everyone, please join this. You got a screen share. We don't see anything. Oh. There you go. So just let just let everyone know that they, if they're new to it, they have to do the uh, QR code to get in. Oops, something changed. Oh. Nope. Nope. Uh, uh, your graphics, yeah. Uh, it went wrong. Yeah, can you put it back up? Great. Can you see, can you see my screen, Gavin, now? Yeah, it looks great. Thanks. Awesome. OK, 10 more seconds, and then we are going to start this game. <clears throat> so everyone go to slido.com and enter that number or if you're using your mobile phone you can scan the qr code five more seconds and <clears throat> here we go let's start with the first question okay so the first question is the one the JRE is a runtime for which programming language? Python, JavaScript, Java, J Sharp. Easy one, so let's kill it in two seconds and done. Let's see your options. Okay, most of you are saying Java and that is correct. Uh, it was very easy, right? Java runtime environment. Okay, let's go for the next one. 
Second question. Java code is typically compiled to is it machine code, bytecode, .exe, .obj? And three more seconds, and then we are done and done. Let's see what you have answered. Okay, most of you are saying bytecode. That means you are the Java developer here. Again, so now we can we know this survey, right? How many people are there in Java field? Great. Uh, let's go for the leaderboard. Let's see who is doing well. And as I mentioned, it is not about just not just about score, the right answer, but also timing. And you can see LXP is on top with seven seconds to answer both the question. That's awesome. Let's see if we can maintain that. Uh, let's go for the next question. Who is the inventor of Python programming language? Ooh, this will be tricky. Okay. Three more seconds and let's see what you're saying. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so let's see the right answer. And that is Guido mm. Van Rossum. Okay, so Jenny, Dennis Rich is a founder of C programming language and Python developed by Guido. How do I pronounce that? Doesn't matter. Let's go for the next question. So maybe it will be a bit difficult. Let's try. In Docker, the software that hosts the containers is called. So I will give you a full 15 seconds here. To think about it. And let's see what you have answered. Okay, most of you are saying Docker engine is the right answer and that is correct. Awesome. And the last question, come on, we are going for $200. And here we go. So guess this technology. So you will find the options in the on your mobile phone. This is quite easy, something related to containers, maybe. So let's see the, okay. And ending the poll and done. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Uh, and let's see if it is the right answer. And that is correct, Kubernetes. Cool, so maybe the quiz was easy. We started with the easy note in the morning. That's awesome. And let's see the leaderboard. And the leaderboard says Asif Hut on top. Congrats, Asif and Alexei, you did one mistake. Okay, not an issue, but last time let's do that. So Asif, you will receive the mail soon uh, from us and you will get your reward. So thank you so much everyone for playing this game. I hope you enjoyed. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Nevin. Uh, I guess uh, that's exciting. So we have uh, some winners uh, in, in this uh, quiz. So yeah, um, back to my presentations. So um, as I mentioned, the, the following 20 minutes will be break down into the four uh, sections. So, well, I mean, maybe 15 minutes. So, so the first one uh, is the overview. So token SDK is being um, architect into four basically uh, basic functions. So, so the first one is create, the second one is issue, the third one is move, and the last one is redeem. So that's actually, uh, correlated with uh, the most um, fundamental um, uh, process of working with uh, any kind of asset. You got to create it, and after you create it, you have to issue it to the actual um, the actual owner of the asset. And then, if the owner wants to move the token with one another, so that's the third uh, functionalities. The last one is the redeem. So the redeem will actually uh, destroyed the representation, so the rep representation move off ledger. Uh, you don't necessarily see that in the uh, real token world, or for example, when you code check, uh, you just hand it back to the concierge. But what ha happens after you hand your uh, code token, like or the little paper slip, is the concierge will, will throw it away. So that's basically represent the last uh, step. Is the redeem is your physical asset will be uh, take to the new ownership, uh, maybe you or maybe your friends or your counterparties, the representation of the token will move off the ledger. That means um, if the asset wants to bring out the ledger for next transaction, you have to do the create issue move and eventually hopefully a redeem. Uh, so that will actually complete the cycle. So um, that's a high level architect of how we uh, architect our token SDK. There are two types 
of tokens uh, that we provide to you uh, use out of the box. So the first one is fixed token. And second one is evolvable token. It's also pretty easy to understand. So for fixed token uh, is more like uh, US dollars or British pound. The characteristic of the token does not um, evolve as time goes along. So that's qualified as a fixed token. So the second type, which is evolvable token, the characteristic or the variables of the physical object will actually evolve uh, over time. So for example, if you can, you want to issue a token representing your house, right? If you have uh, different decorations when you bought a house, but maybe after five years, you decide, hmm, I want to change the decoration a little bit. I want to change it from um, French style to Spanish style. So you're gonna actually spend money to do the decoration. So that might you know, affect the value of your apartment. And hopefully that will actually going up. So that means some of the characteristic of your physical asset is changed. And we want to have a way to represent that uh, kind of changes. So that's when we have the evolvable token type. So after we talk about the token type, we want to talk, talk about the types, uh, how you gonna issue the token that represent like where you're gonna get uh, traded between your counterparties. So that's, again, we have two, uh, two types of the actual tokens. So the first one is fungible. The second one is non-fungible. So when we talk about fungible, it's the things that you can create and then you can issue and the money basically, uh, the value of the token basically works uh, as a money. So you have a hundred dollars, uh, maybe that's a 500. Is that 500? That's a 2000. That's a 2000 um, currency bill on the left and then it equals four, 500 bills on the right side. So that's what we call fungible tokens because um, we want it to be able to break it down. So as for the non-fundable tokens, which now actually become a quite popular names, uh, the NFTs. So those are the things that you cannot break it apart. And if you do break it apart, the value of the representation will actually be um, erased. So, so that's the two types of the, uh, the tokens where you can actually uh, issue. And then looking into some of the flows, uh, for you know the developers in the audience, for the create uh, function, for the move, for the update, for the issue and the redeem, we already have all kinds of uh, functions ready for you to use out of the box. So that's basically is a quick um, glance of the uh, functionalities you can use out of the box. And lastly, before I switch to our second SDK, I want everybody to have basically a thought exercise with me together. So when we think about token representations, so what are some of the assets that you can represent uh, on a ledger, on a DLT? And again, you know, we covered, there are two types of tokens, the evolvable and the fixed type. And for the actual token, it can be fungible and non-fungible. And let's all actually look at the chart. So if we do it, we, we make a chart and it's two by two chart, we look at evolvables again, remember, so that it's the things that the characteristic of your asset can change over time. And for example, if we want to issue some fungible tokens on that asset, what we can issue. So that can be a tokenized real estate property rentals, but we are doing fractional, uh, fractional ownership. That means I have a big house. In the big house, I have five bedrooms and each one of the bedrooms gonna be a token. So that means, for example, if I collect all uh, five uh, tokens, that means the value will add up equal to the entire house. So that's something. Uh, and again, it's evolved because I can decorate different rooms with different decorations. So the value might be different. So that's the fundable one. The non-fungible one is, the, again, it's a tokenized real estate property, but it's a unique ownership. Again, it's the same big house. I have five rooms, but that five rooms all 
belongs to a single ownership. If uh, I want to basically rent one of the rooms, I can't. I have to take the whole room. Uh, so that is like non-fungible. You just issue the token and there's no way you break the token apart and then only take half of value. Uh, for the fixed type, what are some of the opportunities or potential use cases for the fungible ones are the CBDC, the central bank digital currency, the digital dollars, that's probably never gonna change its characteristic over time, but um, one plus one equals two and $5 plus $5 equals $10. On the right side, we have a fixed token type, but it's non-fungible. It might be a tokenized gold brick. So the chemical characteristic of the gold brick is always fixed. It's a gold brick. It's 20 pounds, it's 20 pounds. It's one kilo, it's one kilo. And however, for example, can I say I want to own a fraction value of the golden brick? Um, it's not possible because it's represented in a non-fungible way. So yeah, so those are some of the token types, like some of the use cases that are potentially uh, you can do. And then look down the type of asset, you know, on Ledger, the Ledger asset on Corda can be a security issue on the Corda network or off Ledger can be a real world physical asset, a house in Manhattan. So that is basically uh, use uh, the examples of what kind of asset, you know, we keep saying asset, 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 but what are some real assets? So that might be um, some asset you can think about. It can be either on Ledger or off Ledger. Uh, so yeah, so that's conclude my presentation for the token SDK. Uh, next, we're gonna roll into accounts. Um, and I think, let me quickly check the time. We have 15 minutes. We actually have uh, yeah, 15, yeah, 15 minutes. You got about yes, 15 yes. minutes for this and uh, Q&A. All right, cool. So um, quarter accounts. So with quarter accounts, it's basically, again, it's a functionality that you can use to expand your uh, application to cover more opportunities. So what are some of the opportunities we see? So distributed ledger that deploy and operated by individual and small business, such as a local corner candy store or my friend Roger. So that's the first opportunity that we have seen that is not able to cover by the current enterprise uh, blockchain or we call it a permission blockchain or you can, people can think of consortium blockchain because the cost of setting up a private network is actually uh, quite expensive, considerably to set up a public blockchain. However, if we still want to experience all the goodies with a private network, that's one opportunity we saw that this account SDK is going to help everybody, help our developer with. So that's the first opportunity. The second opportunity is a method to reduce the total cost of spinning up a distributed identity for every customer especially when the number of the customer goes up. So that is more sort of like, you know, very honest word to speak directly to our existing customers who are running consortium uh, themselves. So with our customers and clients who are actually managing, managing a large network, they have a hundred of their clients um, trying to be um, digitalized in a DLT network. The cost for them is also is something, right? Uh, you know, R three work with all of the largest financial institute, but again, you know, when when their customer wants to onboard in, onto a DLT platform, the cost is still there. It's, it's something. Is it? Uh, and everybody wants you know somewhat get rid of cost, right, to save the budget. So that's always the case. So. Uh, with those two opportunities that the account SDK is going to take care for you, what you can achieve is provide scalability to your Corda, to your decentralized applications. So how does this Corda accounts library look like? So the Corda accounts library allows Corda node operator to split their vault, which is the database, into multiple logical sub vault. So basically, originally, you just have the node on the top, you know, which is the party. Right, but now each node can have multiple uh, accounts under the node, right? And what that can do is, outside of the DLT ledger, 
each identity, meaning the end user, the end customers, can actually connect it with the accounts. You know, one person can have multiple accounts uh, under the same node, under different nodes. It's just like how we operate a bank account. I have a bank account with HSBC. I also have a bank, bank account with JP Morgan, the Chase Bank. I also have a bank account with Bank of America. Wait, there's nothing to stop me to have that many bank accounts, right? So with that setup and architect, court, the quarter account SDK now basically allow multi-tenancies for a single node. A pictorial representation of that is now you have a quarter node, uh, quarter node vault, which is again a database. You're gonna have some state, which is the object on the quarter network. And I've been saying this the whole week. The state is the quarter object. Um, in the database, you're gonna have some quarter object that group together. That's can be now called a count. Accounts one, accounts two are in the different squares, and also you can have some state just hanging there, have no account associated with it. And each account gonna have a key uh, and basically um, an identity service that manage all those connections with the account. So the quarter node knows which state belongs to which account. So that's basically how we achieve uh, quarter accounts how we achieve multi-tenancies, how we basically you know, save people money, save our customers, save our clients money. So there are actually a few points that we want, I want to point out is quarter accounts are not quarter identities. They are a different representation of a collection of states and public keys. Again, you know, there's no um, basically uh, hardware wiring or specific uh, place to store your stuff like the enclave, no. So quarter accounts is primarily level two application level uh, architect that allow you to achieve quarter node multi-tenancies. So which means account creation and discovery are implemented on the core depth level, not from the network level. So you cannot expect people to know, oh, that node has 10 accounts uh, <clears throat> and I gotta know it all. So that will not be the case, which actually has benefits to it because you know some of the accounts, you know, the quarter node are gonna just like keep it private because there are some maybe internal accounts. So uh, at the end of the day, you a quarter node can create accounts and then the quarter node can decide whether to basically publicize the accounts to the rest of the network or or or, or they don't. So that's actually provide a higher privacy in that sense. So the second point that I want to point out is the physical vault isolation is not supported. So similarly to what we just see in the pictures, um, the accounts are connected via the identity service. So that means your data are technically not isolated from any other uh, data. They are still live together, you know, like neighbors next to one another. Um, so with certain industries, um, some of the requirement or regulation requires that the data has to have a different isolations. Uh, we will not see that uh, happening using the quarter account SDK, but you know, that will, that's only a very strict specific industries. There's uh, millions of flexibilities that we can achieve with uh, basically uh, the account SDK. So in this picture, is basically what we can do with a quarter accounts SDK. So originally, you know, if you're running a tri-node business network, it's just node A send transactions to node B, send transactions to node C, blah, blah, blah. It's just one, two, three, three nodes. But with, with this quarter account SDK, you can have millions of accounts under quarter uh, node A and then millions of accounts under node C. So what you can achieve is account to node transaction between you know, account and node. Account to account transaction cross a node, for example, A1 to C2, or account to account transaction between uh, the same node is A2 for A3 for basically, uh, you can, for the sake of have a clean, cleaner database. So that's basically what you can achieve with a quarter account SDK. We, you know, from our experience, people are more into it, like people are 
are definitely very favor of these um, um, features uh, from our experience. Um, yes. And lastly, again, you know, I want to widen everybody, you know, inspire everybody with some potential use cases. So the first one is the custodianship account applications, you know, host a few customer per node, such as bank account, brokerage account, etc. The second type of applications are applications that involve uh, multiple teams, you know, larger company. Uh, you can isolate it, sensitive information from unrelated uh, related departments, for example, um, if I have a company that has a finance team and maybe the procurement team, so the procurement will focus in on buying the stuff, and then the finance team will just focus in on paying the stuff. So those kind of information will not stay in the same blockchain, right? Otherwise, when you do the verification, the history of the chain will show everybody. So that's something. The ne next one is an uh, interesting one, is a massive adoption for B2C application, single account per customers. So everybody says enterprise blockchain um, or permission or uh, private blockchain are not for massive consumer base. Uh, I wouldn't argue it, but this Corda accounts SDK definitely opens up the possibilities that we can um, have a potential applications for B2C. So yeah, that concludes my uh, presentations. Uh, Ashash, how are we doing in the chat? Yeah, Peter, um, not many, a uh, lot of uh, questions on the chat. I think, I think it was crystal clear, but uh, I would pull up one question that came up in the middle. Um, so this, this, this guy, who either Adarsh or Akshat, I don't know both of the names in his username. Uh, so he has a question um, which says, uh, I'm not sure if you want to come in others or Rakshat. Uh, so if you want to really ask your question live, you can just uh, pull up your hand or raise your hand and we can get you live. So the question says, if I'm planning to have an agri marketplace where uh, fruits and vegetables are sold and uh, he wants to do that in the form of tokens, what kind of token would you really use? Others, do you want to come live? Yes, uh, I think I'm on mute. No, you're not. So, you're, you're live. You, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah thank you. So actually, I'm basically from an agriculture family. So I was thinking if we have a marketplace for selling B2B uh, agriculture goods like fruits and vegetables so that we can keep the track of how a farmer sold his product and how an end customer is buying uh, the price that he is buying that product. So uh, blockchain would be very much preferable for that. So I was asking which kind of token will be preferred for this kind of thing. Like uh, we have uh, just tracking the th uh, tracking the transactions, how it got executed. Like I will have an app where the farmer will be selling the, their uh, thing. And again, from there, uh, the another transaction is being generated. So uh, what kind of token do you think will be preferable? So yeah, thanks. Uh, so let me actually uh, rephrase the question. So uh, in an agriculture business, so what kind of uh, token or token type or token model or token architect uh, of the applications will be um, suitable for a potential use case, right? Yeah, sure. So yes, yeah, sure. So so in that scenario, it depends on how you are selling your uh, goods. So when doing business uh, worldwide, there are always the retail selling and there's a wholesale. So for example, if you, we are talking about wholesale business that you your family really owns like a massive land and then you have factories and then you have a distributions, uh, everything, and you look into basically have a ledger that keep track of everything with your partners, right? Because if you if your family owns everything all the way from farmer to warm up or, or like the superstore, you don't need a blockchain. You know, I gotta be frank with you. If you got your family can already uh, run everything by your family, then you, you just need a simple, you simply need a centralized system and you can take care of everything by yourself. But if we're talking about a, a larger network you, that your family are trying to sell goods to a place that your family does not have reach, or you're, you're just like working with a partner that is, uh, has big, uh, bigger influences, a system might be this. For wholesale, 
uh, a container of agricultural good can you know load it in the truck. So that container can be a non-fungible tokens because for wholesale uh, goods, um, uh, material or goods come in as a container as a whole, right? So that container can track uh, between uh, from the all the way from the, your factories, your your to your distributors, logistic uh, like shipping, and all the way to basically a second layer or third layer distributors. So that will be a non fungible, evolvable tokens because the characteristic of your uh, your your shipment, your goods will be changed over time. For example. There, there will be one variables in your non-fungible uh, non evolvable token type is the temperature of your container. So the temperature of the container can be changed from like, for example, from the farm is, uh, um, I do Celsius might be like, you know, um, 25 Celsius. 25 Celsius and when it's loaded into the shipping truck might be lower, might be let's say 15 to keep the uh, vegetable fresh. And then it goes to the distributor, the temperature might rise up in the storage. So that's so that temperature will be variables stored in your evolvable token type. Because again, uh, evolvable means uh, the characteristic of your token type will evolve over time. And in that scenario, uh, every time the temperature is changed, there will be a trace, there will be some uh, record on your blockchains to keep track of that. So it definitely will be evolvable for an, an a non fungible token for wholesale. For retail, it might be a different because if you're capable, if you are, you, are, you are running a digital factory, you can basically label every apple Right, you know, if you can label every apple, then you can issue non-fungible uh, tokens because two apples equals, oh uh, no, like ten apples equals a basket of apples. That's also something. So it really depends on how your uh, family runs the business. Hope that answers your question. Awesome. In fact, if you have any more questions, we can do that in the office hours. We have a good amount of time there. Uh, so Peter, awesome session. So I, I like that example of fungible and non-fungible. I never thought we can divide the houses so I can use that for my next session. <laughs> so next time when somebody is asking me about NFT, I'll give the example. Thank you so much, Peter. All right. Thank you, Nam. Great. So after this amazing session, we can go for the next one. So before we have, in fact, we have a break uh, coming up, but then before that, let's do a Bollywood with that angel sound. Hi, okay, Delia. Welcome back for the next poll. Hello, hello. Let's pull up the next poll before you guys see some magic. Okay, what is the name of the character that Karina Kapoor voices in the animated film Roadside Romeo? So it's a callback to the last question. We're gonna. Oh, I see. I see. I see. If people are edging out um, and choosing a particular option. I think we might. We might uh, get this one right. Naveen, do you know the answer? Seeing as uh, you love the I mean, song. I can remove the so, options which are not correct. Maybe I can. I can guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I will not reveal now. Let them. Let them vote, yeah, and yeah. I will try. Don't. Don't give anyone any hints. <laughs> mm. Okay. All right. I'm gonna give you guys ten more seconds. Okay. We're gonna. Go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, all right. Let's close it and pull up the results. And we're back. You guys got I it right. 49% right. of you. It was Lela. Nice one, guys. All right. I'm um, back to you, Naveen. Oh, that's great. Knock, 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 Pucho. Who's that? Okay, so <laughs> I'm straight into that sound. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dalai. Let's move towards the break. So we have a break now. For so you have to be back before eleven fifteen. We'll exact. We'll start exactly at that time. And during the break, we can enjoy some magic. So I'll have my break here itself with Mark, and he's all set with his mind tricks or mind magics. Hey friends, how's it going again? Please give me that.